Hi everybody. So today in class, students divided themselves into groups of three and they have begun class with a problem. The problem is, is how to build a catapult. So we are going to now launch those catapults and see how they did. Here we go, guys, come on up. <laughs> yeah, okay, start is here. Okay. And we're going that way, toward these doors. Okay. Oh, hold, hold that. Okay, guys, wait a second. Hey, we need all the teams out here. Hey, Ms. Horner, um, ours broke. Come on. Okay, so who's the other person in your group? We have Abby. All right, Abby, you take this. You're going to be the marker wherever the ball launches. And here's how it works, guys. So it's wherever, if you could... Just the camera's on. Thanks. If you guys, so how it works is wherever the ball hits first, that's where you're going to put your mark. These guys will go first, then you, then you, and then we do another round. Okay, so we'll take the farthest spot. Three, two, one. <laughs> that counts. You have to put it. You got to mark behind the line. Please note at home their catapult went backwards. All right, next group. <laughs> you have about the approximate amount of time till they go again to make any adjustments. Who is Reese? You guys are blue. All right, gentlemen. Interesting little contraption we have here. Three, two, one. Wow! That was all the way over here. Yeah. What are you doing? We have to. Well, where it first hit the ground. Right? Is that where it hit the ground first? Yeah, it ricocheted off. Oh, and then it went to there. Yeah. Ah, that was great. Nice shot, you guys. Yes. yes. All right. Wait, where's the line? The line is right in front of the yellow. No, 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 no. In front. They went backwards. You know, I can't say anything about ours. <laughs> Oh, here's yours. You guys are pink. Oh. Good job. I would say, yeah, yeah, right about there. You guys did actually better than the other group. Okay, girls, first group goes again. Okay, you can see the markings. So far, we have blue in the lead, pink second. Yellow went backwards. You got nowhere to go but forward, girls. We don't know. <laughs> we are ready when you are. Okay. Is this how far we My gosh, your hands are shaking. Shaking. <laughs> I need leg. Here, do you want me to hold the other one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There we go. All hands on deck. All right. That was better. You got better. All right. We we could use our hands like that. You live and learn. That's why we use the pencil yeah, first. Gentlemen, here we go. Second try. This is the team to beat so far. Three, two, one. Oh my God! I I totally got in your way. I think it would have been like way back here. Dang! Well, for sure, it was at least about here. Let's see if you can get further. Dang. Josh, we found your rhythm. Yeah. It keeps hitting that over there. Just mark the sure, sure. Nice job, you guys. All right, girls, do you have it in you? Yeah. Can you beat the gentleman? Uh, no, I don't know. What that this is. is how far we got to go. Shoot to me. Josh, you're in front of the camera again. <laughs> All right. Oh, dang it. All right, guys. Nice try. Let's go on in. Bring your little post its if you don't mind. Grab it. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to grab this camera. 
You guys go ahead and put away, if you didn't break anything, the supplies. Keep your post-it notes. Stay with your group for just one second, if you don't mind. Stay with your group for just one second. You and your group decide which of the following four, if not multiple, things that you guys experience building your catapult. Did anybody in your group or your group experience overconfidence? Now you can put these up more than one spot. Did anybody in your group get kind of like, this is how I did it a long time ago and you like got s just like set in that way. Did anybody say, I have a hard time making adjustments, you know, this is how we're gonna do it. You just kind of, this is what we're gonna do with that. Or finally, did anyone say, I am struggling with what do we do with any of those supplies? Like, I don't know what to do with the popsicle stick. Go ahead and put your post-its wherever you feel like your group applies to. And then you can go ahead and take a seat. And packets should be out. Blue piece of paper. I think it's blue slash purple. I'm not sure if it's blue or purple. Oh my God, everybody functional fixedness? Nobody in here was overconfident? No, I said we win, but you're right. But you did win. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was so I guess that wasn't overconfidence. Well, we're going to actually apply these terms and talk about your little experience out there that we did to some of the problems that we experienced with problem solving. If you didn't hear me, I said these terms are listed on that purple sheet in your packet if you're following along that way. If not, they're also on this PowerPoint. Today, we're going to go as far as we can. The goal, what will happen tomorrow, just in case you are tuning in, I hope you all do. So uh, we'll finish up the PowerPoint in class tomorrow. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to have some checking for understanding questions for the students. And so these are really, really, really beneficial. So I wanted to provide them for you guys because I knew you weren't gonna be in class. So I would try to, to do those to make sure you get what these terms are all about. Okay, so let's get started. The first term, so now remember how I brought you into this class today. I said yesterday we talked about how do we solve problems. Today we are going to talk about the problems we have with problem solving. And the first problem we have with problem solving is people tend to be a little bit overconfident in their situation and understanding um, really how well they're going to do. I've got a guy up here with a thong. Sometimes people like that are a little overconfident that other people want to see that. Um, some people would say, you know, good for him that he has enough courage to do something like that. Everybody to each his own. But when we overestimate how accurate our judgments are, and we do this a lot in life, to be quite honest with you. Um, you probably do this more than you ever think you do. How confident you are in your judgment is not a good indicator of being right or wrong. And that's something kind of important to note. One of the other things I'm gonna ask you guys to do here today is bring up personal examples. So I'm gonna pause at each word and say, okay, can you guys give me an example of when you, in your life, were a little overconfident and it backfired on you? We noticed that no one went out there with overconfidence. In each class today, there's been a team that has gone out with a little bit of overconfidence and they failed miserably. So usually I get somebody that does that. Anybody have an experience in your personal life where you can think of when you were a little overconfident or somebody else you know and it backfired? Yeah. Do you have one, Emma? You just had your hand. Just pencil up. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll ask you this for each of these. Why am I doing that? Why am I saying give us an example? Okay, before you tell us, why am I asking you to give me an example? This has everything to do with our memory unit. What's the vocabulary word I'm looking for? This is a good review. If you can apply meaning, you are encoding it what way? 
semantically, semantic encoding. So if we just sit here and write definitions down and just listen, how much encoding is that going to be? Shallow, right? To apply meaning, now all of a sudden you're going to be able to remember it longer. So you might look at me like I'm an idiot, like why the hell does she want us to write all these damn examples down because of that science that's behind that. So my example might mean nothing to you. So it's better if you have an example. What do you got, Ms. M? All right, so when, it was like a couple years ago, my brothers and I, we had like a baking competition and I went <laughs> into it thinking my cupcakes were gonna taste the best because I had the best ingredients and mine turned into like little pound cakes and they were supposed to be light and fluffy and they were just awful. Ah, that's awesome. That makes me think I should do that over the holidays. Give each of my kids a certain amount of supplies and say, I like that. Sports, any athletes in here ever overconfident? Do you have one particular that you can think of? Well, sometimes like when I go into like, track, when I go into a race, I always think like, oh, I'm you know, you know, better than these people sometimes in some scenarios. But <coughs> it just ends up being something that I probably should have thought. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it, a lot of times it backfires on yeah. you. There's a difference between being confident and then overconfident, right? Nobody in here would say you were overconfident on any test you've ever taken. Mm -hmm. I know this information. I got it. I got it. I got it. Right. And you come in. I'm certain some of you would say maybe you were a little overconfident on some of my tests at some point where you were like, I need to study a little bit more. I didn't know the material as much as I thought. Right. So overconfidence can come in all kinds of shapes and forms. Um, my example that I was going to share with you guys is this is a little bit more serious, but um, do you guys remember the year the Cubs won the World Series? And I, all, uh, most cities, you know, turned into like big party zones and what have you, and Iowa City was no different. And my son at the time was going to school in Iowa City, so I remember paying attention to this, and a ton of students just kind of hit the streets, like kind of like a semi-mob, and celebration, jubilation, they were so happy. And one of the freshmen climbed a light pole, and he was a little bit overconfident in his strength. And I, and anyway, he fell and he ended up injuring himself so much that they ended up having to take him to the hospital where he didn't survive. Overconfidence can come into play in a lot of really small things like our catapult building that means nothing to major things in our lives. Sometimes people in relationships are a little too overconfident and they think their relationship is secure and it's not and they become complacent, right? So overconfidence is number one in problem solving. These are in no particular order of importance. Number two, confirmation bias. Um, I only put hindsight bias up there because I didn't want you to confuse the two because we have learned hindsight bias before in this class. Hindsight bias is when you say you knew it all along type of thing. Then what is confirmation bias? It's also known as anchoring bias. Don't confuse that. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about anchoring heuristic. That's a bit different. Anchoring bias, confirmation bias. Circle the word on your notes, look, or embed that in your head. That's the key component of confirmation bias. You actively search out and look for information. Give me an example of how you actively look for information. Pretty simple, guys, but just tell me. If I'm looking for information to confirm that I'm right, what would I do? If I'm looking for information to say I'm right about the election, what might I do? Look it up. Right? Shh. Can I find any source that would tell me either one, either presidential candidate I could support that would say this presidential candidate was winning on that day? Yeah. Did you notice that? Depending upon the source of information that you pulled, Biden was winning, and depending upon the source of the information that you pulled, Trump was winning. It, it was crazy. You can get confirmation when you're looking for information, when I'm actively seeking it out. An example I put down here is doctors. Has anyone ever been in a situation where you went to the doctor and they thought that they knew what was wrong with you, so they started actively looking for things that confirmed their idea of their diagnosis, but then later their diagnosis was incorrect and they missed a different diagnosis? Makes sense? Mm -hmm. This has happened to me, my Achilles. I ruptured my Achilles. 
years ago, went in, doctor thought I sprained my ankle, gave me an x-ray. An attendant tear will not show up on an x-ray. Therefore, he did not see that I ruptured my Achilles. Sent me home with crutches, say, said, stay off your ankle, ice it, elevate it, da, 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 da. Two and a half weeks later, I am still in as much excruciating pain. Finally did an Achilles tendon test on myself, which is this, in case you're ever wondering, you step up on your toes. If, and then on my one foot, I could do it, but on my other foot, it wouldn't go anywhere. It just was like, why aren't you moving? It wouldn't go. I tried and tried and tried. I ruptured my Achilles. Two and a half weeks later, I was sent to emergency surgery to get that Achilles because what happens to your tendon is that it'll wind up. So where it's at is down in your ankle. It actually will wind up behind your knee. So it's pretty serious if you don't get that taken care of right away. But that doctor missed that because they were, they were believing that it was a sprain. They were confirming their idea of that. Does that help for an example? Does anybody have an example that I didn't say that they could relate to? Confirmation bias. Nothing? If you think of something, let me know. This was the example I was telling you guys about fake news. You know, confirmation bias, you, tend, you could find all the information you want to support your belief out there, but it's not necessarily true, but you are looking actively to support your belief. Now, a lot of students confuse that with this one, number three, belief perseverance. That's the reason why I had you circle the word look. Because if in the example, the person is actually looking for the information, then you know it's confirmation bias. If it's just a belief they have and they're not looking for the information, then it's a belief perseverance. The difference is I'm not actively seeking out the information. So saying with our, you stay with that initial idea, even though you are proven wrong. You may have been a victim of belief, belief perseverance at some point in your life. You don't have to answer this, but have any of you ever been stereotyped by someone because of how you look, dress, act, et cetera, et cetera, and then a teacher was completely wrong? Oh my God, look at this guy coming in my classroom first day. He looks like a hippie. He looks like he's completely lethargic, doesn't care anything about his school. Oh, it's Sam. Who's Sam? I've never heard of this Sam. He's going to be such a loser in my class. He's not going to care at all about what he's doing. He doesn't turn in his, look at he doesn't turn in his assignments. Oh, he got an A on that test. Well, that was just a mistake. He still doesn't care. You know, even though there might be evidence pointing me the wrong way. So this is a silly example up here. Tom talks shit about you. He talks smat a, smack about you. You've all probably had this happen sometime in your life where somebody talked bad about you. And you believe he's a real piece of crap because he talked bad about you. But later you find out that Tom never said anything about you at all. The person who told you that was completely wrong. But you still have it in your mind that Tom is a crappy person. Right? Belief perseverance. You're persevering with that belief. You're holding on. Another way to say it is you're holding on to that belief. And you're not actively looking it out. Do you see the difference? I'm not seeking. I'm not searching that information, I'm just holding on. Anybody have any parents or grandparents, anybody older than you, where sometimes they just hold on to that belief? How about work? Did you ever get new people coming into your job and they say, well, what if we did it this way and it might be a little bit more better or efficient and then other people are like, nope, this is how we've always done it, we're just gonna do it this way. That's never happened to anybody out there? I would assume at some point you have either been a guilty of this or a victim of this in your life. So think about belief perseverance, how it can actually get in the way of solving problems. All right, this falls under the umbrella of the term fixation. Fixation, we've heard before when I've talked to you guys about Freud and how you become fixated on a particular stage in life. This isn't fixation of Freud, this is fixation on solving problems, okay? And so the first word is mental set. This is when you approach a new problem in a very old way. 
and then you just can't, you think it's going to work, and you, it's not working. But you know what? It used to work. It worked when I did this three years ago, and you just get stuck on it, and you can't think outside the box. That's why I have a picture of outside the box thinking, right? So it's, you struggle with thinking about how to do it differently. And is that due to belief perseverance? Do you see how the two can connect? Sometimes you have a belief that this is the best way to do it, so you can't think of another way of doing it. So, fixation. Did anyone out there build the way you did when you were younger? You, you, you build these. Did anybody have that conversation? In this class, nobody has ever had to build a catapult for any reason. I didn't know if you had to in elementary or junior high or anything like that. I've had a few kids that they're like, oh my God, we had to do this in a math class or a science class for some reason. And they kind of get stuck on keeping those the old way. Maybe you've done a math problem. I don't know if that's a good example or not. And this is the way you always solved the math problem. And you can't get past that. And then when you have a new equation, you keep kind of going like, well, it worked here, but it's not working here. I'm trying to think of something in my personal life, like at home or something where I've done that, where I've got kind of stuck and I can't get past doing it the old way. You have one? Um, doing the breaststroke and swimming, okay. I always would grab the wall when I would do my flip turn. And okay. My coach has told me not to do the, grab the wall. You need to do it touch. Flat, and I cannot change it. I always would grab the wall. So it's it's kind of like what you're explaining is kind of like a habit too. You know, yeah. it was like an old habit that just kind of gets stuck in. Even though touching the wall would probably be more efficient and faster, you just can't get past that. Yeah. yeah. And then what goes hand in hand with this, which would be opposite, is divergent thinking, where you tend to think of multiple ways to solve a problem. I don't know if you guys ever saw the movie Divergent. It's a little dated now, but you know that's exactly what they're talking about, that they can actually do different multiple tasks versus convergent thinking, where you, you're, you're stuck on the one. Functional fixedness, what, what other use is there for the item? A lot of you guys said that. Pink team. Where's my pink team? What was the item you were stuck on? Um, pencil and paperclip. Both of them. <laughs> I struggled with using those two items. Yellow team. What item did you guys get stuck on? The paper clips and the popsicle sticks. They just wouldn't stay together. And then we didn't understand why there was a the pencil. Okay, so what the heck am I supposed to do with this pencil? Good. Blue. <laughs> the pencil. Did anybody at the end start using the pencil? I don't remember in this class. Did you guys ever use the pencil? We took the pencil out because it didn't you work. You started with it and then and you it said, went backwards. okay. So yesterday in class, people at home, I had you guys crash on an airplane and I asked, you know, what are the five usages that are things that you guys would keep? Um, the answers were based on an expert in survival, not myself. One of the choices was Crisco oil. A ton of the kids either didn't know what Crisco oil was at all or could only think of it for its original use, which, which is cooking, and it's in the kitchen. Nobody chose Crisco oil on their list except seventh hour there was the one team that did. I couldn't believe they did. When you look at the experts' reasoning behind Crisco oil and why to keep Crisco oil, there was probably eight different reasons. I mean, it was amazing, all the different usages for Crisco oil. When we get stuck on the original usage for it, if you're in the woods, you can't think to use a leaf, right, for toilet paper. You're out in the woods, what, how am I gonna wipe my butt? Grab a, grab a good leaf and wipe it away. That's not functional fixedness. All right, let's test ourselves, you guys. So which, from the words that I gave you, let's look and see what the answer would be on this one. Television commentators with extreme political views on either side are often very popular because they appeal to strongly partitioned viewers. Does this sound familiar? It sounds very familiar in our recent times. Research suggests that they are often very wrong with their predictions despite their high level of certainty. And they suggest possibly due to the fact that they do not sufficiently appreciate the point of view of the other side. These commentators may be guilty of 
with high level of certainty. What is my answer? It's one of the words we've just discussed. What are you going to say, Sam? It is overconfidence. Belief perseverance is when you do what? What's the key word? You, you, you stick with your original even after you are proven wrong. Okay? So here's the next one. Reese. Reese. Reese believes that global warming is a myth and as a result does not look at any information that supports the theory of humans causing global warming. Because she's only looking for information to confirm her existing opinion. Got it? So now you're not going to get that wrong on the test, right? When it says looking. No, you will not. A district attorney finds out that a man he persecute, prosecuted excuse me, and was convicted was found to be not guilty due to DNA evidence. Still insists he was guilty. In 20 years, the person served in jail was justified. The district attorney is possibly being affected by. Believe perseverance. Do we see that recently happening? George Floyd. His death. How, how am I relating that to that? Let's bring this to modern day. Every single day we are doing stuff like this in our lives. Bring the George Floyd, you all know the story. How does that have anything to do with belief perseverance? Or how could it potentially have anything to do with belief perseverance? Think about what everybody was saying about it. Think about the sides people took. Reese, you look like you're thinking something. Well, I guess the George Floyd case, wasn't there something like the, the officer who killed him? Um, was he like aware of the fact that like, George Floyd's like previous like, um, legal matters? I don't know. I'm not sure about that, but how would you relate that to him and belief perseverance? Because maybe the, uh, maybe the officer still thought that um, George Floyd was He, it clouded his judgment, yeah. his problem solving. Could be. Anybody else? Yep. Yeah, we all talk to that thing, like, How? Even though cops do some good things, there are some bad apples. So that you have people saying, look at, you know, I have this belief that cops are all bad. Here's another example of that. You aren't going to change my mind, even, no matter what you say about the situation. Okay, so it can work both ways. Uh, for and against you. Next one. After answering a bunch of multiple choice questions in a row that are worded in a typical way, Marty comes to a question which says all of the following true except. He's been answering the other questions in a routine, fails to notice a change in the question, which leads him to choose the first option. What is true? What problem in problem solving has caused Marty problems? <laughs> a lot of problems there. He's answering it the same way he was. He's stuck in the mental set. Okay? Good. Last one. Richie doesn't have a hammer and wants to hang his cool new Justin Bieber poster up in his dorm room. He looks around and uses his shoe to take care of the task. Ricky does not have functional fixedness. All right. Scrap paper, just wherever you have a little bit of room on your sheets there. First example that comes to your mind when you hear these words, your first example. Don't think about this, okay? The first example of a bird that comes to your mind. First example of a color, a motor vehicle, a hero, a board game, and a rock star. What would be the first example? Somebody's calling me. Again, don't spend time really, you know, like deep thought on this. If you're at home, go ahead and down and put down your first example of each of those as well. Everybody got their answers? Ms. Taylor? 
All right, let's see if any of you answered any of these answers for your best example. How, raise your hand. Did you say robin, sparrow, or eagle? One person, two people. That's it? What the heck? What do you guys say for a bird? Huh? A first example of a bird is a tree. Oh, I thought it was a horse that you saw. No. What did you guys say for a first example? A bluebird? I said bluebird too. Cardinal? Okay. Jeez. All right, guys. What about color? Raise your hand if you said red or blue. Oh, lots of you guys. Okay. How about you said for a motor vehicle, a type of a car? You might have listed the name of the car, but you said a car. So, mini. Hero, somebody, did anyone say Superman or Batman? Reese did on that one. A game, anybody say Monopoly or Apples to Apples? Monopoly is probably a little bit more famous. Rockstar, Bon Jovi or ACDC come to mind for anybody? What the heck did you guys say? Freddie Mercury. <laughs> Queen, there we go. Okay, why am I having you do this? Your best example, your first example, your best example of anything is called a prototype. That's the term. It's called a prototype. So if you have your best example, where do these examples come from? How do we form them in our mind? They're based off of a term called your schemas. Follow me here. The words in red are what I'm trying to stress to you. So prototypes can lead to inaccurate assumptions of the people because you have these schemas. What is a schema? It's a framework that you organize your information. So if I can just have you guys back up just one second when I'm talking about a schema. Think of your brain like a file cabinet, literally. It is a file cabinet. That's your schema, and you organize them into files. The files are how you organize the thoughts. So let's say, what is your schema of music? Give me the categories of music, guys. Country. Rock, pop, jazz, okay, you got it? So you have a file folder of all music in your head. The schemas are then divided into file folders that you could pull out. If I said to you, give me your best example of a country western singer, who would you say? It, okay, it doesn't matter, but Blake Shelton is, a, is an example. He is your prototype. He is your, some people would say, stereotype of a country western singer that fits your schema of what a country western singer should look like or sing like, et cetera, et cetera. The prototype is the best example of the concept. The concept was country and western, right? And she said Blake Shelton. Now, how does this have anything to do with what we're talking about? Look at this. The term is representative heuristics. Now, it glows hand in hand with prototype. So that word should be listed under representative heuristics. Representative heuristic is your best example of how you represent things in your mind. So judging the likelihood of things based on how well they fit your prototype. It causes you to cloud your judgments. If you look at these two guys on this PowerPoint slide, if I said to you, who is the librarian here? Most of you would say this guy because this guy doesn't look like your stereotypical or prototype of a librarian. Are you following me now? So that's called your representative heuristic. How well things represent your prototypes. So if I asked you all, what is your prototype of this baby, of mental illness? Throw some out there. I literally want you to throw the things that you don't think I want you to say. What are some stereotypes that people have out there? What are prototypes that people look like if they have a mental illness? What do I look like if I have a mental illness? You might not think this, but what do other people think? Sad. Okay, I have a sad face. Disheveled. Very disheveled, unclean, unkept. Are you following me? Now what's your prototype of a mentally ill hospital? You've watched enough television and movies. Crazy patient. Psych, yeah. What does it look like? Padded rooms. Bars on the windows. Bars on the windows. So you're missing one. If I'm in a mental hospital and you have a prototype of me being a straight jacket, you bet. Look at that picture. Do some people, is that their prototype of what mentally ill institutions look like? 
do you see how that can cloud your judgment? Mm -hmm. Make sense? Have a great day. We will see you guys. Oh gosh, not till Tuesday. Just a bias a lot, isn't it? It's more of a stereotype that you yeah. formed. And it's due it to the can cause bias. Oh definitely. Definitely. You do you want to keep your machine? Yeah. Bye everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a great day.